Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 28, titled, All Beings Are My Mother. Okay, so, so the gift of the Tibetans is they bring to us what was lost. A thousand years ago, they were invaded by Muslims from Iran, mostly, who wrecked all their Hindu temples and Buddhist temples, but they couldn't crush Hinduism 100% because they needed the people in the villages who were still Hindu to work for them, so the Hinduism kind of survived. But the one thing they considered completely useless were these monks in these monasteries with these huge libraries, like Vikram Shila that, uh, that Ravi showed us, you know, that ruin, you know, that was a huge, like Harvard, that was like UC Berkeley. That was a huge university of 20, 30,000 students. Well, I don't know how big that was, but Nalanda, the biggest one, had 20, 30,000 students in its heyday. And they came from all over Asia and from Iran, actually, and from West Asia as well to study there. And then they went back to different places with a higher understanding of themselves and of the world. And like somehow, they never had any dark age here. They didn't have to become a crazy thing with the bird. You know, the bird library of Alexandria in, out in, in the Mediterranean was not burned by Vandals or Visigoths, it was burned by Christians. They didn't want people to think freely and that old Greek thing about, you know, man is the measure of whatever and like you can, you can be noble and you can do this and that, you can, like Socrates. They didn't want that, they wanted these people grumbling under the church. So you had a big dark age for a long period of time in Europe, uh, in the latter part of the first millennium, but they never had that in India. They developed it in the And they created a brilliant, magnificent culture. They had Freud before Freud. They had quantum physics before quantum physics. I, I have another lecture, I could really do that, but not tonight. They had karma, it's not a mystical theory. Karma is a biological theory preceding Darwin by thousands of years, right? A big news flash to the British gentleman, right, with his beard, it's Darwin. And in Texas, they still freak out about it. Ted Cruz cannot imagine that he might have been, he might have been connected, Mrs. Cruz, Mama Cruz might have been connected with the 90% chimpanzee genes. He's not going to hear about that. The textbooks are Texas. Ted Cruz. Meanwhile, from Buddha's point of view, Ted Cruz himself is still a chimpanzee. <laughs> He's just a bit hairless. You know? And we were all personally chimpanzees. There's no disgrace. We were pretty cheerful when we were chimpanzees most of the time. Sometimes they get uptight. But, you know, they, they have like a, you know, whatever. They have some fun. And, uh, and uh, so the Buddha saw the rel- interrelatedness of all animal forms. And he, he had the theory of evolution. But his theory of evolution is very different. You become a higher form by being more altruistic. Not by being more violent at all. You're a lower form by being violent. By being violent because why? Violence means you armor yourself up, create a stronger boundary between self and other. You see the other is just something to be hurt or consumed or eaten or you know, then you get a lower, you get to be the crocodile level where you're just a big mouth to eat something in front of you. But but not but if you're nonviolent, you sort of appreciate the other. You don't necessarily, you know, we have, we got language. Why do we have language, human beings? Because we don't eat each other the minute we need each other. We chat. That's why, if you're the other animals, they have no time to talk because they either eat or be eaten. And some people pretend that's a human thing, you know? But that's not our thing. We have the most dainty teeth, and actually, in America, they have been replaced more or less totally by these overcharging dentists. <laughs> because we eat too much sugar, and you know? we have an average 122 pounds of sugar a year, each human being. We all snuck into all other food by these creepy food people. So anyway, so they were they were invaded a thousand years ago, and then the Indians, like Ravi said himself, they forgot that Buddha was ever there. They didn't even know. The British were like, "Who was that Buddha guy?" They thought he was an African until 1837. Did you know that? 
that the, the British thought what I was from Africa, but I, I wore a camera. <laughs> and and uh, uh, anyway, it's okay. We got it. We got it. Okay. And the Buddha, Buddha thought Buddha, they thought he was from Africa because Buddha statues of Buddha have these little like curls on his head. So they thought, oh, he came to Sri Lanka from Africa. And then the Brahmins they had forgotten. So, oh no, Buddha was God. But we don't know what he was in Indian history. We don't know that. He was, but yeah, he's Vishnu, not Buddha was God. But as Vishnu, he taught a wrong teaching because he was fooling people. They have a really funny story about Buddha. Meanwhile, of the 1,200 major rock cut monuments in India in the archaeological survey, 900 were made originally by the Buddhists, 100 by Jains, and only 200 by Hindu. But then they took all over all those caves and, and monuments and things, and then they forgot what it was until the British came and figured it out. Otherwise, they thought Buddha was something from China or from Africa. So they completely forgot their Buddhist heritage, which is actually half of Indian culture. You know, India, my, my great friend Lal Mani Joshi, who sadly died prematurely of a ruptured ulcer in the train, going from Delhi to, ben, to Benares you know, years ago. But he had the perfect formula from G.C. Pandey at Gorakhpur, you know, a great Indian historian and archaeologist, which is that Hinduism today is half from the Vedas and half from the Shramana people, which is Buddhist and Jains mainly. And so all your vegetarianism, that's not from the Vedas. The Vedic guys were cowboys. They herded cows from Indra, you know, was running around and made sacrificed animals, and they had barbecue. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the cow, cow was sacred, but because it's just like it's sacred in Texas. <laughs> And they, but they don't know that though in India they think oh it's Veda, Veda, we have Veda, so not Buddha, just Veda, they're like that, which is too bad. Actually, one of my failed missions in this life has been to bring India back to that knowledge of itself. And and you know you ask, I always ask Indian audiences, who is the most famous Indian in history? What has been your biggest export around the world? And they go like Gandhi, Krishna, uh, Dal. Curry. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's Buddha. Every Chinese villager, millions of them knew about Buddha for thousands of years, all over the world. And now today, the Buddha, like in California, everybody's going around like Zen or mindfulness or something. You know, you can hardly go to a restaurant. You have to have like Zen fish, Zen, uh, mostly Zen vegetables, uh, <laughs> Zen mushrooms, right? So, so they, they should take true pride in that Indian. They really figure it out, and, that's, and I failed to do it. Deepak Chopra and I, one time, we were going to have a tour, uh, and together, and we were going to, he was going to like get me booked on his own fame, and then I was going to give lectures on Buddhism, but he decided he'd rather give the lecture, so we never did it. You know? <laughs> and then he's, he's better paid than I am, so that's okay. So, so, so the Tibetans, however, so then when this was destroyed, luckily, there were these very enlightened people in India who were at that time, from the 5th to the 10th century, the greatest figures in Indian Buddhism were, uh, in Indian civilization, I think, were what are called the Mahasiddhas, the great addicts. And these were yogis, as well as scholars, and scientists. They were all three. And they were something like, I call them psychonauts. Like an astronaut, but an astronaut of the psyche. Meaning, they were able to lucidly dream, they were able to lucidly die, and lucidly take rebirth, you know, like which is quite an amazing thing. You know, their their whole vision of rebirth is. I, I know it's a shock, but we are psychologists here, Californians. But the the Buddhist insight about rebirth is that the the soul goes with a very subtle energy body that's sort of like a dream body. Well, you know, you have a dream, and you, in the dream you are kind of body, you see things, you hear things, but rarely do you pay attention to what your body is like. So when you wake up from the dream, you assume you were just the same embodiment that you were with the same eyes and ears and things, but not necessarily, actually. And because your body is made of subtle energy in the dream state, and if you have a different, your mind can reshape it, if you're conscious of your own self-image at a neural level, then you can have a different body in a dream. So when you die, you have a dreamlike body like that. And then you go through different things, etc. And then the way you take rebirth as a human is you're lucky to be a human again, if you're attracted to the human form. 
but you might not be. The human form is not the most logical form to adopt if you're scared and a bunch of wolves aren't chasing you. You know, if you have a nightmare and you're in a dream state, after death dream state, and you're being chased by it, you know, like, like metallic wolves or something, you might want to turn into a, a metallic bear or a lion to go back and attack the wolves, and you might be attracted to that kind of stronger form than the human form. Human looks like good wolf meat, and no, you can't really defend against something violent and frightening. So if you go to, to death, into death in a very frightened way, it's not good for you. But if you're very open and you remember the, the human form and you're attracted to male or female, depending, because you, you liked them in your previous time and you thought they had nice soft skin and you didn't want to have claws so you could pet them, you know, or, or caress them. It was unpleasant, you know, crocodile caress is like chalk on a blackboard. It's really like, ooh, no foreplay. Elephant, elephant sex is terrible. It's really awful. A poor female gets stuck in the back of the by a big stupid guy, and it's like he's like premature ejaculation personified. And and so human, if you're attracted to that human form, they say that in that state you're going to see a lot of couples. You cruise up and down Geary Street or Fifth Avenue, and you see things have people getting it on in different places and apartments because you can see through walls in that dream. And then you see one couple that you get very turned on by, which is often one from your previous life's family of some kind. That's why a lot of people get recognize their grandson or something like that in the, in the studies of children remembering previous lives. And bam, you, know, you get into it with him. And if you're going to be female, you like the guy, and you're a little, you have a little competitiveness with the, with the, with the female. And if you're going to be male, you like the female, and you're competitive with the father, like a Freudian experience before conception. That's the Buddhist view. I know it's a bit of a shock, but that's the report from Buddhist scientists who explored that by lucidly dying and being reborn. They, 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 the Book of the Dead, the ultimate Book of the Dead, is based on reports of people who consciously went through those processes and remembers them again. I know that sounds incredible to us, but, and we can, and some material scientists who thinks they've discovered nothing, and therefore they're very smart, they can challenge it and say, this is bad evidence, and I don't accept that testimony, and blah, 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 they can say that. And we'll be happy to debate that with them. And they can come up with alternative explanations for all sorts of things that are recorded about people remembering the tales of previous lives and so on. And, uh, so anyway, this, this kind of knowledge in science about the nature of life, how to control your mind, this higher ability to educate. When the Dalai Lama got an award at Columbia University, uh, an honorary doctorate of humane letters or something, he thanked the trustees and the people there assembled. And he said, thank you very much. He said, I love getting honorary degrees because I don't have to do any work. <laughs> he said that first. And then he, and then he said, and also, I'm honored because education is the most important thing. But the, and that is a Buddhist view. When I was writing about Buddhist ethics and Buddhist society, you know, the rules of Buddhist society, I had these five principles of, of the Buddhist, uh, uh, I call it politics of enlightenment or social enlightenment. And one of the principles I had to make up a word for, which is educationalism. And I'm sorry for the barbarity of the, of the word, but what it means is, a theory that human life, the main aim and purpose of human life is education. Because education is not to go and get a job and get a skill, of course there is that. But the real thing, in the human being itself, its whole main thing in life is to learn more and to evolve as a being and become a better kind of being. That's actually the most meaningful thing to possibly do as a human being. Because if you understand that what you do in this life, what you learn in this life, is what will shape how your next life will go. You get a strong motive to learn a lot. You don't think it's over when you get your BA or MA or your PhD. You realize you're, it's a lifelong thing, learning. And it's, and it's the greatest pleasure, in a way, in the mind, is when the aha thing, when something, when you newly know something, it like expands your world, changes your world, and you become, you become something bigger when you understand something. Right? So that's why you guys are all here. I thank you. So anyway, so this knowledge anyway is the gift, basically is the gift of the Tibetans. In a sense, 
that they preserve it from India. I mean, other people have other gifts. It's not like nobody else has gifts. A lot of different people do. And to this is all shifted around, and a lot of things that we think came from here, they're actually interconnected with something. But, like, nobody, we don't know that in America, but we would not be independent from the British if it wasn't for the Indians. People of India, you don't, nobody knows that. Did you know that? No. There was a vote in the English Parliament at some point when Washington had beat back Cornwallis to some extent, but was like totally crippled and the Continental Army was a mess and everybody was running around, ridiculous business. And, and uh, Cornwallis asked for new regiments. And they had a vote in the English Parliament and they said, guys, we have so and so many more regiments to send anywhere. And we have two choices, send them to re reinforce Cornwallis or send them to finish the possession of India. And which would you rather have? Fur, tobacco, and lumber, or silk, spice, beautiful cloth, and weaving, and whatever it is they make in India, or pearls, and whatever. Which would you jewels, you know, from those Maharajas? Which would you rather have? Oh, we'll have the spice and the pearls. <laughs> Leave those Americans to their own devices. And also, Tipu Sultan, who was famous supposedly bad guy. He was a good guy. He was a Francophile. And he sent three treasures of jewels, three chests of jewels to the American colonists, to Lafayette, to Lafayette. But they were all stolen by Dutch ship captains and people, you know, the colonial people. So they never got there. So people don't know that. But he sent three chests of treasure to the colonists, to George Washington. So this India-America partnership thing is a really big deal. If finally we ever wake up to it, our people. So that's the gift of the dependence. You, know, you can manage your mind, you can manage your life, you don't have to depend on some mood altering drug, and you can, you know, you can have a more fun in life, be more altruistic. You can follow Jesus' you know, order to be more compassionate and more altruistic and turn the other cheek and love the other person because you get a method as well as, a, as an order. You get a command from a sacred, holy person. But, but where's the method? Actually, some of the Christian monastics had methods, but then the Protestants crashed all of that. And they, you know, they, because they, you can't perfect yourself because you're just hopelessly bad and you just have to wait for God to fix you up and just get rich in the meantime and build a big church next to Rockefeller Church and then God will pick you up because you're nice and clean and you went to Harvard or something ridiculous. Same. And so, so, so they lost those self-developmental things you know, because Luther himself couldn't manage it. Poor guy, every time he went to the tree outside the monastery, he would meet Satan in the, in the tree. He didn't have a good California to -to toilet. He kept meeting Satan out there. So he freaked him out. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> but, um, so this is their gift. And then, but you know, Ming, there's this guy, Men Chade Ming Tang, you know him down in Google? He's the jolly good fellow of Google, he's the vice president for, for well being at Google. And he said, all of the Tibetans are all enlightened beings. So he goes a little crazy. And, and that's a heavy burden for them to bear because they are human beings. But I like it. I like his attitude. So the Tibetans carry, even though they are not that enlightened yet themselves, but they carry that culture. It's in their, it's in their uh, cultural uh, makeup. You know? It's not a racial thing, it's a cultural thing. And uh, that culture is very loving and friendly. And after all, if you have meditated, if you've gone to a culture where a major meditation, tens of thousands of people for, for a millennium have been meditating that all beings are my mother, just you do it right now, think about it. Look around you. If you, if you meditated on the way that you develop compassion taught by the future Buddha, and the deacon of this church actually has an image of Maitreya in his office, I thought that's the future Buddha. We were all waiting for him. I was really delighted to see that. That's really cool. And if you if you follow their teaching, then what the first thing you do is it's a meditation called mother recognition. And it comes from a sense of your own infinity as a being. That is to say, you didn't just start when your parents conceived you, or when you were born, or in the third trimester, all this stuff they get on and on with. Or after Jean Piaget says you develop a sense of identity at five or whatever it is, you know, developmental stages in Western psychology. You brought your what they call your mental gene or your spiritual gene from your previous life. That's why if you're Mozart, you're in a symphony at five, 
and you have everyone has every child comes in with special abilities that they have that are unique to them. And and so actually I forgot I was talking about. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> uh, so what did I say? What? Oh yeah, you said, yeah. So so therefore there's also you see, you get rid of this incredibly stupid idea that some religions high priests promote, which is that there's the first beginning to the universe. It came out of nothing. So we are nothing. So it's some other thing is something, but not us. It's so stupid. There's no uncaused cause. That's just an incoherent thing. It's that simple. No, that's why you have to have blind faith. Yeah. Oh, you know, oh, you know my joke that I learned from Chicago theologians about the definition of faith. I got to teach you that one. You'll like that. That's a good thing to learn. But I learned from Chicago theologians. The preachers say, "Who can tell me what faith is here in the congregation? Come on now, you're all good Christians. Who can tell me what faith is?" Everybody's silent. And little Johnny's in the front row. And he's like this. The preacher, well, now I know I'm embarrassed all you folks. Little Johnny says he can tell us what faith is, and you all can't say anything. Come on, who can tell us what faith is? Silent. So finally, okay, little Johnny, you can tell us what faith is. I can, preacher, I can tell. Okay, little Johnny, tell all these good people what faith is. He says, yes, preacher. Faith is believing in what you know ain't true. <laughs> Isn't that great? What are these cynical theologians in your Chicago Divinity School? Okay, so, so therefore you are beginningless beings. You've been chickens and eggs and whatever, humans and dinosaurs and everything. Everyone personally has been that. Amoebas, David, you have been gods and angels. No beginning, believe me. And everybody else has no being in the universe as well. So that means you cannot say that every other being in the universe was not your mother sometime. When you consider that biologically speaking, these ordinary self-centered enlightened people, the most selfless thing you're programmed biologically is to be a mother. Right? Guys don't understand that. You know, they think that somehow it happens something. But they don't realize the struggle that it is to bear a child, really. And they kicked him out of the living room until recently. They let me in one out of four children, they let me in one, and I passed out. <laughs> I had to sit down. And I demanded an epidural for myself, personally. <laughs> Are you kidding? What a tough job that is. So the point is, therefore, you meditate on this. And you think of everybody as someone who's of another race, another gender, a male as well as female, and you see the motherliness in them. And you sort of acknowledge that, well, this being somehow had me in its body, shared its bloodstream with me, but shared its milk stream with me. Everyone, and you're the most alien one, or your enemy, someone who you hate, who you stay by, you should freak out because they beat you up or something, or they root you, and everybody's been your mother. Then what happens? My teacher, when I early learned this meditation, and I wanted to do it, and I did it, and I did it wrong, actually, because, but I won't never find that. But I, I a little bit overdid it, typically. And uh, then he would always send me to New York to see my mother of this life, and then I would have a hard time in the subway. And then the bus, especially the subway, where you're walking against a stream of people. Because when you meditate that, it's like a meditation of familiarity. Familiarity, right? So everyone you see is like a deja vu experience. Because you've been meditating on the motherliness, the mother look in everyone's potential human face. Because even Hitler, even Stalin, even Mao, even the worst mass killer. I won't mention some local ones. <laughs> they are your mother. And you sort of see that familiarity like a child and sees his mother. You somehow get into that part of your psyche. Now, in a culture, my whole point about it is in a culture where that is a widespread meditation to such a degree that Tibetans will say, the simplest one who didn't meditate, etc., in that life, they would say, all the old mother sentient beings, magen sentient tangent, they say. All the old mother sentient beings, meaning all male ones, female animals every time. Then when you look at somebody, no matter what kind of person it is, when they see you look at them, 
there is something that emerges from their face that's like a kind of feeling of familiarity. When you go somewhere in like some place where nobody ever saw like a white person, or if you're a black person, you go somewhere and they never saw a black person, or if you're a yellow person, they never saw that. People look at you like you're weird, you know? Like uh, some Chinese villager in the ancient time, they called it like white ghosts, you know? Like a weird hairless rabbit, a weird blue eye, like a, and no black hair, you know? And then the long face and big no hood. They think it's funny. They think it's a funny creature. But nowadays they work TV, so they sort of, you know, and they like, they like the Arnold or whatever, you know, and they, they, they're cool. But, but in the old days, that's one of the good things about all this media imagery, it makes people familiar with each other in a certain way, who are allowed to watch them. So, so that's the kind of thing that the Tibetans carry. They meet you, and they have a feeling of kinship with you. And therefore, people who meet Tibetans in Nepal or India or China, or anywhere, they sort of gladly like them. They gladly live in California or in Berkeley. They tend to like them. It doesn't mean that Tibetan is an enlightened person or anything, but it means they carry this special idea that you can be loving to people without being, you can be spiritual without being pious and sanctimonious and annoying and obnoxious. You can be happy. That's the key. They come to this, they revive the ancient tradition that it is scientifically necessary and possible and realistic to be happy. That being unhappy is unrealistic and unknowledgeable and ignorant space and self defeat And that is a very different thing. That therefore, reality is a refuge. Reality is, is an embrace. It's something you, that, that embraces you. It isn't something withheld from you. Now, people who have theistic faith, they can have that feeling too. If they, have, if they really focus on the loving God thing, these weird things about the punishing God, you know, and everybody goes to hell if they do this or do that, you know, and the violence that is all embedded in those things because of the distortion of what I think were genuine, wonderful teachings from some of those ancient teachers. So, you know, Moses, Buddha, I mean, Moses, Jesus, you know, Muhammad as well. Muhammad was very, he liked the love a lot, actually. He had a lot of friends. And, and, but he had to fight to defend himself. They, were, they, they tried to kill him quite a lot. So, so then that's unfortunate. That's an example that gives these people the, the, the leverage to distort his basic teaching, which was surrender to a reality that was fundamentally compassionate and good. That's what Islam means. Islam doesn't mean go beat everybody up who doesn't think what you think. That's completely not what it means. But unfortunately, that's mostly how it manifests nowadays because of systematic distortion over many, many centuries. Anybody who pretends that that's not what it mostly means is not being honest. But that originally means this is not true. It was originally a, a beautiful thing, actually, in a very rough society um, of Muhammad. He was a cool guy. He was actually he was a good husband. He married a lady who was much older than him, who funded him and protected him against all kinds of things. He was like a business manager for her, traveled and, and made a fortune for her, and he, uh, and he completely uh, was devoted to her, you know, in his main part of his life. She, she consoled him and he was freaked out because this angel was telling him all this weird stuff. <laughs> you really know the story. One feels sympathetic to him, actually. He's a great guy. All right, so that's the gift of the Tibetans. Any questions? <laughs> Cheer up, the gift of the Tibetans. Why do we now go, yeah, I have just been working, or oh, I'll say one more thing. I have just been working for the last, very intensely, last, especially a few months, but for years, actually, on a less intense level, on a 250-page graphic novel, that's like a glorified comic book, of the life of the Dalai Lama to be finished by his 80th, which is not over and won't be over until decades, we are very sure, uh, if necessary. But uh, his 80 years, his first 80 years, let's say. And it is amazing, this man, who is a product, who himself is a gift of the Tibet, and who has gone all over the planet except, and he did go to see Mao and company in China, but he hasn't seen the latest batch of Chinese leaders yet. I think he will see. He probably did see Xi Jinping when he was one years old. Because he was friendly with Xi Jinping's father. And Xi Jinping was born in 1953. And Dalai Lama spent six months or a number of months in Beijing in 1954. But Mao asked him to go there and he went down there. 
And so he might have been presented with the baby to force blessing. I think that's likely. He gave a blessing to Xi Jinping when he was one year old, but I don't know that. It's just a speculation. But I can't imagine the proud father not bringing his eldest son to his very friend the Dalai Lama who gave him a gold watch and who he really liked. And he was along with Hu Yaobang in the early 80s trying to give the Tibetans a break. Xi Jinping's father did. And he was busted for being nice to the Tibetans by a devil who was not nice. And Jiang and these people. So there is some hope about Xi Jinping. I just want you all to know that in case anybody thinks Tibet is a lost cause. It may not be. But what I want to say was is watching the Dalai Lama in doing this thing was sort of like making a movie script for him. Making a comic book is like making a movie thing, you know. And he went everywhere. 331 major journeys since 1959 to 209. Probably another 150 since, maybe 500 major journeys. Many of them with 15, 10 to 15 destinations. Four days in Germany, three days in Holland, two down, two days in Australia, New Zealand, Cambodia, Japan, Taiwan, etc. I mean, it was just everywhere he went, and everywhere he went, he met the leading people. Angela Merkel, he met her when she was just a politician, before she was chancellor, and he met people who later became president. He met Obama when he was a senator, and he was really thought to be too young to run for president, and already met him then. And, um, and speaking for his people, and speaking about kindness and love, and, and insisting that politicians should have the interests of people at heart, and not just how to make money, how to exploit them, how to deceive them, never accepting that that's what politics is, as we've been told, and it's, everyone is no good, right? And, and also never giving up completely on the Chinese government and definitely on the Chinese people and reaching out to them. They have a million Twitter followers in Chinese, which they, they rush around trying to block, you know, the government does. And, uh, and it, it's really moving that there is this man, because it's not just the Chinese. Our government has supported this in their ignoring and their genociding against the Chinese. The European governments have it. They all think they're making money in China. And so they would never speak up to the Chinese like, hey, you shouldn't have done that. Or you, we wanna, we're not going to give you business if you do that. No, they've given them everything. You know, there was really bad, older Bush is to blame very much for that. Because around the time that the Cold War supposedly ended, and you know, by trade restriction, we changed the government in Russia for a while, and then unfortunately the KGB put back now something close to something bad. But we changed it around 1990, and we changed the part-time government around the same time, by, by not, do, not dealing with them. So then, China kills everybody in Tiananmen Square, and then what do we do? Oh, that's okay, we'll do business anyway. Whatever you do, then you got to think, you run to save the street, don't you? Kissinger said. So we support them. They, they might have changed earlier, but the Dalai Lama just doesn't get discouraged, doesn't get mad at us for not speaking up for him. He saw Bush Sr., he saw everybody since then. Clinton always kind of hung out in the armchair next to Gore. He didn't invite him to his own office because he's always selling. So like, oh, he's a nice, smart guy. But he's going, oh, some things. You know? <laughs> Mrs. is better. I'm for her. I vote for her. I'm going to vote for her a hundred times. She's better than him. Naturally. She's the better hat. <laughs> and here she'll put him out to pass her with his hot dogs and his burger. <laughs> Although he can't have it anymore since his heart attack, he's got to have a nice, he's got to have veggie burgers if you come to California with veggie burgers. <laughs> or India, good dog. So, so uh, it's a, just so moving to see this man who, if these world leaders who all like him, oh, I, I met him because he was a spiritual leader and everything, and they're inspired by him, but then they don't live up to that themselves, and they don't feel good about it, but they don't. They think they, they're like the bad guys in the, suite, in the Korean soap operas, that's the way the world is. I have to sell out. I have to avoid the principal things. I can't be honest with people. I have to lie. I have to do all this stuff. Which they don't. They just choose to. Because they're just chicken. You know, they're, they're not really aware. They're not, uh, they're not realistic. That's what it is. That's what it is. They don't listen to their wives. <laughs> Seriously, they don't. So that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say that. that we should all pray for the Tibetans together. And we should think about Dalai Lama on 80th birthday. And he tried to retire four years ago from political responsibility. 
But nobody still really can represent the Tibetans but him. But he does it informally since then. He's traveled even more since then, seeing people. But the Chinese are getting governments to like restrict visa and don't let it in. He can't go to somebody's birthday party. Tutu is really mad. South African government. He got Mandela out of jail by persuading Mandela in correspondence to change the platform of the ANC from violent to non-violent. And that's why the apartheid people had to let him out of jail, out of that island that he was in prison. And yet the current government, which is still the ANC, doesn't let him have a visa to go to Tutu's birthday party. So he had to go by Google. He had to Google his way to his birthday party. It's very moving. I'm very moved by it. So please all of you pray for them. Help Tibet House for everyone. You know, the Tibet House thing is a marvelous thing that the Dalai Lama really likes. I want to explain it maybe at the very end to you. And it, which is that a Tibet house is a cultural embassy that proves, kind of, without making a big fuss about it, the existence of the Tibetan people as a distinctive people. Because it shows their culture, which is their unique culture. It has traces of Indian culture more strongly than Chinese, but also it has some traces of Chinese culture, Mongolian culture. But it is its own unique thing. It's a really amazing uh, melting pot of its own Tibetan people. If you notice those faces of people, they didn't all look like Chinese. Some looked like Western, or some looked like Persian, or some looked like Nepali, some looked like Mongolian. They are they're themselves a kind of interesting melting pot. And they are marvelously independent and strong people. And they, they are kind of a symbol. You know actually what they are? How many of you saw, I hope, the Avatar movie? I saw that movie 30 times, I think, at least. And I could live in that movie. I, if I only had a tail and a Blue but the climbing trees like that, man. I'd be one of those guys. They are so cool. I love them. And that tree, Ewa tree, you know, the, the luminous thing. That's the only thing I didn't like about it, is they didn't save Courtney. Sigourney. Sigourney wasn't saved by the tree. Come on. They dumped Sigourney. Instead of giving her a nice Navi body when her own body was human body was shot. I was very upset by that. But you know, they wanted to build a suspense, you know. But the Tibetans are like the Navi. They are like those people who are standing against this thing of extract everything, suck out all the oil, track the underwater, put poison water everywhere, all over Texas and North Dakota, make the Naga, the underwater beings, angry with humans, and bring on droughts and plagues and all kinds of things. And don't live in a clean place and don't moderate your desire. Nobody's asking everybody to go and live in the dust, but in moderation. You know, they say, I, I know these energy guys. You guys need more energy. And then what? Times Square? Taxi lights all the time. Who needs that? They could turn the lights off at night. How about that? Save on electricity. We turn off our switch in the kitchen. Come on. We buy like good refrigerators that don't. Why, why do they have to have lights flashing in like Vegas all the time? more energy. It's ridiculous. It's this lack of self-control is what it is. And, uh, and we, can, we can do that. So anyway, that's it. The Tibetans encourage us that we can. We can be happy. We can be cheerful. It's all right. That's their gift. Look at them. They, they're being genocided and they don't ask. I mean, some of you do. But mostly they don't ask for violent liberation movement. You know, and then people say, Oh, Dalai Lama, he says nonviolence. Where are the Tibetans today? They're all being crushed and messed up. Isn't that awful? And then my answer to that is, Yeah, it is still awful. But how's Afghanistan doing? Are they free and nice and cheerful and happy? You think so? How's everything? Even Israel, are they doing well? How about the missiles rain in, they build a big wall, they, they have to be nasty to their neighbors, they, they, they're sort of conceited that the neighbors are going to hate them forever, one billion neighbors. Give me a break. That's not a way to live. That's no good. So nobody, violence is not winning anything either, was my point. We didn't, how did we do in Vietnam? Rambo did great since then, with propaganda movies, but we didn't do great there. With all our weapons and all our machines, we couldn't control a guy, a bunch of guys running around with like, black pajamas. It was like with a little silk hat and black pajamas and planting, planting bombs in cafes. We, didn't, we couldn't control them. You can't control people. They want to be free, they want to be happy. Leave them alone. 
if they want to mess with each other, then you know, try to help them stop. That's really the best thing they do. And have a happy time at home. How's that? Listen to your wife. <laughs> then she'll be happy. Then you'll be happy. Right? Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone.